I was born by the river in a little town. And just like the river, I've been running ever since. It's been a long, a long time coming. But I know change is going to come. Oh, yes, it will. 1963, when Sam Cooke recorded this song, he had everything to lose. He was one of the biggest pop stars in the world and one of the most powerful black leaders in a really segregated music industry. But he had to do it. He was front and center with Dr. Martin Luther King, Muhammad Ali, and other civil rights leaders who were facing unbelievable oppression and racism and doing something that seems so obvious now, simply trying to bring equality to all men. I mean, it's hard to even imagine what was on the line at that point, right? I mean, here was the former gospel singer who, in becoming a pop star, had crossed a line that she couldn't cross back over, digging into the gospel to say, what needed to be said. This wasn't just a song about hope. This was a song demanding change. A change is going to come. Yes, it will. And so this song drove the civil rights movement. But even beyond that, the spirit and the message that Sam Cooke captured was so powerful that it grew across generations, inspiring countless artists and activists to rise up and speak their truth, changing history along the way. And he spoke to each of us because he also spoke to all of us. So to me, even as a fan, it was monumental. I mean, I'm not exaggerating to say that this song saved my life, which is why I started with it. It literally gave me faith when I had none, and it let me know that I could carry on, giving me clarity and direction in times when I was completely lost. You see, music is so powerful, you guys. I mean, it's around us all the time, but it's largely untapped. We don't even realize we can harness it for our own personal change and growth. It's important because it's bigger than race, it's bigger than belief, and it's bigger than politics, and it unites us all. So today, I'm going to share with you how music can be a meditation, how I had my own personal TED Talk over 20 years ago, changing the course of my career and consequently my life, and how we can take ownership of an abundant and easily attained resource to quiet our busy minds so that we can drive change within to the places in our hearts and our lives where we need it the most. So as I was preparing for my talk, I did what a lot of people do. I think everybody talking today did the same thing. I went down the TED Talk rabbit hole, way down the TED Talk rabbit hole. <laughs> I had my mind blown by some of the talks on technology. I mean, it's amazing. It's changing our culture exponentially every day. But I can't help but feel that the robots are winning right now, you guys. Like, they're kicking our butts. We're doing their bidding instead of them working for us. You know what I mean? I mean, for instance, how do we balance real life and social media? <laughs> What's enough? What's too much? Why is it so hard for me at my shows to build an emotional consensus with my fans these days? They seem so distracted. Why do my kids and their friends struggle with screen time addiction? Why are we all so distracted? Brian Eno says that carefully constructed boundaries can create expansive freedom within them, okay? So in this time, it's all about curation, simplification, and singularity of purpose. Now, people have different ways of dealing with this. For those of you that have taken up a traditional meditation practice, I applaud your tenacity. <laughs> I'm really impressed by that, but it's not the only way to find quiet, stillness, and calm. Music is a meditation. By tuning into that singular frequency, by turning on to the flow of the song, and by dropping out of the noise and into the music, we can calm the chaos. There's an unbelievable amount of detail in what seems to be monochromatic because we're too busy all the time. And by simply limiting our boundaries, we can find a richer and rewarding experience within them. So you guys can tell, right? I mean, music, I'm a musician. Music's my meditation. Um, it's the way I see life, 
and it's the way I live life, and it's through that lens that I'm talking to you guys today. So a few years ago, I hosted my first songwriting workshop. It was my first time as a teacher. As an eternal student, it was pretty scary to stand in front of a room looking to me for direction. So I prepared and prepared. I was going to teach the nuance of lyric writing, how to write a perfect pop hook, the importance of a strong bridge. But as I stood in front of the crowd for the first time, everything fell away, and I started improvising. I started talking about my own fear and my own insecurity. I, I could feel something in the room that I hadn't thought of until I was on stage. These people weren't just here to learn how to write a perfect pop song. As I got to know them, I heard the repeated phrases, I can't, I'm stuck, I don't know what to do. Sound familiar? I mean, we were talking about songwriting, but you know, we were also talking about life. And so here in the room, who hasn't felt that? I mean, we all have. But the beautiful thing is that the sticky moments are invitations for change and growth. In music, just like in life, pushing through a difficult period often creates the space for something that's deeper and more profound, especially if we approach it with calm, trust, and confidence. Music is magical in its transformative power, and it's available to all of us, unlike many of the other disciplines. You don't have to be a songwriter. You don't have to be a musician. You don't even have to be a mu huge music fan. You simply have to listen to music. And music... It's everywhere. It's in our cars. It's in our grocery stores. It, it drives film and TV and video games. It's so everywhere that for a lot of us, we've lost our connection with its deep and ritualistic power. So one of the questions I was thinking about is, how do we reconnect with this power? And that's kind of what I want to work on today. Well, the first step is understanding what happens physiologically when we listen to music. I wanted to study this a little bit. Now, in 2011, Dutch researchers led by Dr. Jacob Golige conducted a study on music and visual perception, finding that the music that one listens to can actually change their visual perception, affecting what they think they see. So not only can music affect our moods, but it literally can change the way we see the world around us. We can hack our own happiness through conscious musical choices. In 2013, Dr. Robert Satore conducted a study that was uh, basically comparing the emotional intensity of music to the amount of dopamine released in the pleasure and reward centers of the brain. So he found that, this, that they were directly related, and it was similar to the effect of food, sex, and drugs. So listening to music that's emotionally challenging for us, rather than being something we should be scared of, like, I don't want to cry in front of my friends, it connects us to those feelings and is psychologically and physically better for us. So all this is to say that music can be a conduit to something deeper. Um, and in those sticky times when we're lost, when we're out of balance, when we're facing a big decision, or simply need to clarify an unclear intention, listening to a piece of music can open neural pathways to a new vista. If we're conscious of the musical choices we make, we can choose the path that we'd like to take to get there. So come with me for a minute, because some of us may identify as huge music fans, but every single person in the room has been affected by music. So what song gives you goosebumps? What song do you put on when you need a good cry? What song do you sing at the top of your lungs when nobody's looking in the car? Because we all have one, right? Or along with this stadium when your team wins? What song played as you walked down the aisle at your wedding? What song will be played at your funeral? These are your transformation songs. So, so they're already there. But in order to maximize their impact, we have to change the way we look at them. For most of us, our strongest relationship to music is in our past, from our teens to our early 20s. Now, science tells us this is due to the rapid development of the teenage brain, as well as the early emergence of the self. And we glorify those often happier and more easygoing times, don't we? I can't tell you how many people come up to me at my shows and talk about back in the day. You guys know that phrase, right? It feels so defeated because the day's now, right? I mean, I think it is. I mean, we just need to put a little bit more intention, fight some physiological and mental entropy, 
and make those memories today. And music is the perfect vehicle with which to do it. So I have a quick little experiment. You could try this either with me in your head or maybe if you have some time later. I hope you may be connected to a song when I was just talking about that. If you did, what was it about the song that was important to you? Why did it impact your life? And how did it impact your life? Find some new music, music that's new to you that impacts those same emotions and build a relationship with it. Now, that's something I do all the time, but if you don't know where to get started, I've included a list on my socials that you can find of the songs I find to be the most impactful. And I actually talked to a bunch of friends of mine, so it wasn't just my favorite songs. I also put Dr. Golija's playlist of the 10 happiest songs of all time. They're great, they're funny. It's stuff like We Will Rock You and, you know, but they are, they, they really are great songs to put on just to, to, to be happy because music does have the connection. But, and this is huge, for any of this stuff to work, because it can be a bit esoteric, you have to give yourself permission. Everybody in this room is an artist. Anybody disagree? You are. It's important to understand and acknowledge. Gabriel Garcia Marquez says that in order to truly become artists, though, we have to find the magical beauty in the mundane around us. When we start to see the world with those eyes, we find meaning in the most beautiful and the most unusual places. So I'm going to tell you my TED Talk my own TED Talk from a long time ago. I was on tour <laughs> with Leonard Skinner and Ted Nugent. My drummer had become intimate with Ted's daughter. And they decided that it would be a good idea for her to ride on the tour bus with us one night. Um, so, as you can probably imagine, if you know who Ted Nugent is at all, you know that I oppose this uh, move pretty strongly He's far too aware of his love of high-powered firearms <laughs> and killing things. But it happened anyway. So we're about to leave. Ted Nugent comes onto the bus, and I'll repeat verbatim what he said as he looked deep into our souls. He said, I know you're all gentlemen. I expect you to comport yourself as such because if anybody lays a finger on my daughter, I will effing kill you. He said the other word that I can't say. And he's laughing hysterically as he walked off the bus before bounding back on, wagging his finger and saying, I'm serious. <sighs> so, as you can imagine, I freaked out. I went to the back of the bus and I was figuring, you know, what, what happens if we get kicked off the tour or what do I do if he has me pinned to the ground <laughs> questioning my integrity? But ev eventually I calmed down. I picked up my guitar and as my guitars often serve this purpose, it, 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 came with a song. And I wrote a song about my father. I wrote a song about a New Orleans funeral for my father, who was still alive at the time. And I don't know where it came from. I tapped into something that was beyond me and into a truth that's probably deeper than, than I could claim as my own. So um, the song I'm going to play today is uh, one of the mantles of my career. I have 14 records, and I have some hit songs, but this is the one that really means a lot, I think, to my fans and that they've connected to. And it's, it's created a deep intimacy with them and through that, a deeper resonance in my career. And all of it came about because I was trying to avoid <laughs> Ted Nugent's wrath. <laughs> so, thank you, Ted. This song is called Today. flowers, sweet magnolias, New Orleans style, hey and play, be a funeral procession, second line rhythms, won't you walk me that mile? in 
and find a tomb for my hiding. And let me rest in there, rest for a while. Oh, and make a grand presentation. All of my family, yeah, remember my time. Well, the river is running. Runs with Mississippi mud. My life is good. So lay me in flowers, sweet magnolias, New Orleans style. Oh, and play me a funeral procession, second loud rhythms, walk me that night. Thank you so much. <laughs>